What was your rank? During World War II, I, my uh, highest rank was sergeant, and during the Korean War, my highest rank was first lieutenant. Okay. And um, other than you know the, the conflict zones, where have you where have you served, or you know even including those? During World War II, uh, I served in uh, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Sicily, Italy, France, Germany, and Austria. During the Korean War, my division was sent to Germany, ironically, back to a city of Augsburg, which my division took during World War II. I was back in the city I was familiar with. Must have been interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so were you drafted? Or did no, you I enlisted. I enlisted in September of 1942. <laughs> and where were you living at the time? Right here in Meriden, over on Dexter Avenue on the east side. Yeah. <laughs> right, and um, why did you decide to enlist in the Army? Well, at that point, the the war was in full swing. You know, the, the Japanese had already uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, and Germany had declared war on the United States, and so, uh, and so did Italy. Uh, so we were both sides. Uh, the war in Europe was going on, and the war in the Pacific, and a lot of my friends were signing up because uh, we were in a, uh, uh, you know, uh, very patriotic, I think, the country came together uh, as a result of that attack on Pearl Harbor. And a lot of my friends were signing up, and, and so I went to, yeah. Is there any reason why you chose the Army over the other branches? Yes, uh, because I had some previous training. Back in 1940, they had what they call CMTC camps. Civilian military training camp. It was the summer deal, and I had gone to CMTC, and I had uh, taken infantry training up at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. So I was familiar with the process. Do you recall your first days in service? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. They put me on a train here in Maryland. I went up to Fort Devens, and the first few days, of course, you spend getting your uh, uniforms uh, and getting your shots. And uh, then every day they would make everybody fall out and some sergeant would stand up and call off your last name. And you had to answer with your first name. And if you he called off your name, that meant you were on a shipping list to go someplace. And I think it was probably the third or fourth day when they finally called my name and they put me on a, sh a train and shipped me off to Camp Cross, South Carolina for basic training. Yeah. <laughs> what did it feel like, your first days in service? I think because I had been through uh, the CMTC, that part of it seemed to be quite familiar to me. So I, it was not a a whole new regiment for me. It was uh, uh, very good. Of course, it didn't uh, hurt that uh, one of the sergeants up in Fort Devons was my cousin John, so I had uh, somebody to talk to once in a while up there. Yeah. Tell me about your, your boot camp and basic training experiences. Okay, now I, I did my uh, basic training at Camp Cross, South Carolina, it was strictly uh, infantry training. Uh, we had our uh, time with the uh, phys ed. We had our time with the rifles. We had our time with the firing ranges. I think I fired just about everything there is to fire. Uh, I'm an expert rifleman. Uh, I also uh, had training with the, the 45 caliber pistol, uh, the Thompson submachine gun, the Browning automatic rifle, uh, grenades, uh, pretty much uh, the whole basic, we've had our share of forest marchers and uh, that goes with it, which was part of the uh, physical training, I'm sure. But uh, it was quite an experience, yeah. 
I enjoyed it. You enjoyed it? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Can you um, describe what your drill instructors were like? Uh, my, my drill instructor was really a, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, I had already pictured a, a drill instructor being some of tough, uh, uh, one of those people that hollered at you every 20 seconds. And the Sergeant Whiting was my drill instructor, and just the opposite. In fact, uh, I had a little trouble with some of the areas of the obstacle course, and Sergeant Whiting uh, came down, and he says, I'll see you after lunch, after supper. And we'd go back out, and he'd show me how to do things to the Army way. Yeah. You, know, you know what they say, there are three ways to do things. you got the right way, the wrong way, the Army way. And uh, I, I found it to be very helpful and really a, a, one of the nicest sergeants I ever met. Yeah, yeah. How did you get through your basic training? Very well. I, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I put on a lot of weight. <laughs> the, the army shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I, 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 I went through it. I, 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 I could have stayed there another eight weeks. It would have been fine with me. Yeah, yeah it wasn't to me. The thing that I did object to is back then, when you finished your basic training, you were supposed to get a 30-day furlough. And I never got my 30-day furlough, because when I went and asked for my furlough, they said, uh, we can't give you a furlough at this time because you're being sent to communication school. And I said, well, where is that? And well, it so happened, it was on the, it's still the camp crop, on the other side of the camp. Yeah, So the following week after I finished basic training, I started school. Hmm. Now, you mentioned um, to me earlier that you were you were enlisted during World War II. Yes. But you were an officer during Korea. Yes. Did you have to go through any officer training? No, none. I got a direct commission. Yeah. Direct yeah. I, I never went to OCS or, uh, no, I'm not a 90-day wonder. Uh, I, no, I got a direct commission. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you mentioned you were in World War Two in Korea. Both no, no. Oh, d during the wartime, yeah, yeah, yes. But both, yes. I, I was in the service during both wars. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, you mentioned this briefly earlier, but where exactly did you go again? During World War Two. Yeah, you start with World War Two, and then, you know, again in Korea. Okay. When, when, uh, when I finished my schooling, uh, I went to communication school at Camp Croft following basic. And when I finished that, I was shipped to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and assigned to the 8th Armored Division. And I thought that would be my permanent home. Uh, I was in Fort Knox, I think, three days. We shipped out to... Camp Campbell down on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. And from there, I went to Fort Dix, which was a port of embarkation where I was loaded on a boat. And off we went to, I landed at Casablanca, Morocco, North Africa. Uh, from there, we, now I was assigned to the 10th Engineer Combat Battalion which was part of the 3rd Infantry Division. And now our training there was getting used to the new materials. Uh, as a communication person, we were getting new radios, so we had to learn to use the new radios. They changed the coding on us, so we had to learn new codes. Uh, but what was going on in the war at the time the British were chasing General Rowell, uh, the German general. He was retreating back across uh, Egypt and Libya into Tunisia. And here the 3rd Division is sitting in Morocco. So they decided to call up the 3rd Division and head for Tunisia so that we could bottle up the German army between the British coming in from Libya and us coming over through Algeria, which we did. <laughs> One peculiar note, when we got to Tunisia, 
and we had the Germans bottled up in Tunisia, our General Truscott assigned one of the company of infantry to a prisoner of war compound that they established over there. In the first three days, we had 38,000 German prisoners, and we didn't have enough, so we had to sign a whole battalion because the company wasn't enough to contain the whole rest. But, uh, Go ahead. No, oh, from there, of course, we, we went on to, we, my division led the invasion of Sicily. Uh, we went to Palermo. Uh, at the time, uh, General Patton was our, our corps commander. General Truscott was our division commander. Uh, we got to Messina before Montgomery, which didn't make him happy. And then from there, it was Salerno uh, in Italy and up through the center of Italy uh, until we got to Monte Casino, where we were stalemated. Uh, we tried to take the mountain. Uh, the British tried it. The French tried it. Uh, they pulled us off the casino front and sent us back to Naples, where we loaded the boat and made an end run behind enemy lines into what became known as the Enzio Beachhead. And the third division was the only American division to uh, make that initial landing. So we ended up on a beachhead for four months, which I like to refer to as four months of hell, because the Germans held all the high ground. They could see everything we were doing down there. We finally broke out of that. That was in January of '44. And, and we finally broke out of the Banzio Beachhead in May 25th, I think it was, and uh, fought our way up and captured Rome on June 4th. And, of course, it was overshadowed by the bat uh, landing at Normandy two days later. They pulled us out of Rome after a short stay. Back to Naples, we loaded the boats and made the landing at southern France. And now we, we've got the Normandy landing in the north, and now we're landing in the south, so... We're kind of getting the Germans between us. So from there, it was up the the, uh, the valley through uh, Avignon, Besançon, Grenoble, all the way up to Strasbourg on the Rhine River. We ended up, uh, when a German made the big counterattack for the Battle of the Bulge up in the Ardennes, we were south of that in what was known as the Colmar Pocket. And... Uh, in Alsace, and we finally uh, pushed the Germans back over the Rhine River, and we crossed the Rhine into Germany. Uh, we captured Nuremberg, Munich, uh, Salzburg, Austria, and Birch's Garden in, in Austria, and at the end of the war. Yeah. Now, what happened was, uh, after the war, uh, I, I went to school, uh, and when uh, 1949, I guess it was, uh, a local unit uh, where my cousin John, who had been that sergeant up there, was now a captain with the local guard unit. And he was looking for a first sergeant. And uh, he asked me if I would be interested. I said, no, uh, you get me a direct commission and I'll be interested. So I guess he wrote a letter to somebody because the next thing I know, I was offered a direct commission uh, with, with uh, that unit, so which was the 43rd Division. And shortly after, in 1950, we were activated, sent to Camp Pickett in Virginia, where we got some training, and then uh, we were shipped over to Augsburg, Germany. Now, Augsburg, Germany happened to be a town that the third division I was in took back in World War II. It was an easy take because Augsburg was a hospital town and the Germans had a lot of wounded in the hospital and they didn't want the town bombed or, or shelled with artillery. So they kind of gave up fast and moved out of town. So it was a, kind of an easy take. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what was that whole experience like? I mean, how would you, if you could sum it up? You know? <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I'm glad I, did, I had the experience. I, I would never want to do it again because uh, there were times when it was, you know, I lost an awful lot of good friends, uh, a lot of good friends. Uh, I think I, I mentioned to you before, I, I wrote a story when I came back for my kids, but I, I kind of left out the gory things. Uh, although I did mention in my book, one of the first I saw was the fellow that taught me how to use the mind detector, and he ended up getting uh, killed with the uh, with an S mine, which I used to call bouncing Betty's, and that was in Tunisia. But after that, it was uh, I lost so many friends. Well, one was a close friend of mine. Uh, the Germans were shelling our area with their 88s. And most of us ran for our foxholes. And uh, when the, except McCarty, he didn't get to his foxhole, so we went look at why he didn't. And he was in his pup tent, he was laying there. They were shaking him, trying to wake him up. Well, when we finally got in there, we found out why. It looked like he started to get up, and a hunk of shrapnel came through the side of the tent and took the back of his head off. And so he went way back. It looked like he was asleep, but he was dead. Uh, I lost two of my radio operators uh, with a shell burst and took out five guys all at once, but two happened to, have to be my radio operators. And one of them was one of my top operators, uh, George Myers. Uh, I, I, I go on and on, but uh, I was in the hospital, not because I was wounded, it was because I had pneumonia on Anzio, and they shipped me down to the beach hospital and on February 29th, the Germans bombed it. And the thing I felt badly about is we lost quite a few nurses in that bombing raid. Uh, and you know, there was no reason for it. Those, those hospital tents down on the beachhead were well marked, and the Germans knew exactly where they were. Yeah. Yeah. What about Korea? I never got to Korea. Oh. As I say, we were sent to Germany over to Augsburg, oh, okay. and we were over there until uh, May of 1952, and when we got back home, then they got shipped back home uh, the summer of 52, and I got uh, released from active duty. Yeah. Now, what exactly was your specific job assignment while you were active duty? I, I, during, during War II, uh, my, I was... Uh, in charge of the communications, mostly radio. We were on the go so much, we used very little telephone. Almost all our communication between uh, the companies and the battalion up to regiment, up to division, was all done by radio. And so we had we had excellent radios. They were called SCI 245s. And they were good for about 60, 70 miles. So we had good radios. And it was all done with Morse code. We did very little uh, clear text uh, messaging. And uh, so I was in charge of the communication, which what happened was I mentioned I lost two of my radio operators. So while we're on NCO for four months, I had to train two new ones. And they're, they're mentioned in my book also, Berger and Viola. And uh, they became my two, two new operators. Uh, so I had to teach them Morse code uh, using an oscillator, yeah, but they became good operators, yeah. Uh, you mentioned you received a lot of indirect fire through... Oh, d d direct fire. Indirect yeah, fire. Yeah, uh, yeah, just about every place we were. Uh, one of the things about while we were at Anzia was they were firing one of those big railroad guns from Rome down into the beachhead. Uh, and the shell was so big, we could hear it sometimes going over our head, headed down toward the beach. I think they were trying to knock out the boats that were down in the, I suppose I shouldn't call them boats, the Navy calls them ships. But uh, they, it seemed like they were most of them were aimed down there. But if you could picture, let's, like us being downtown Meriden, and the Germans being up on West Peak. And they're up there with their binoculars. They, 
they could see everything, every part of that beach, they know, and they had bracketed at any time, they, you know. So at nighttime, during the day we get shell, you pretty much had to stay undercover in a wooded area or, you know, you don't go out and expose yourself anywhere. Uh, at nighttime, you're a little free to move around. Almost every night, like clockwork, the JU-88s, the Joker bombers, would come over and drop AP bomb uh, anti personnel, and uh, that it, it's like almost like a hand grenade, except when it hits the ground, it throws a lot of shrapnel, and uh, that was uh, lousy. Uh, but every place we went, uh, General Kesselring was the German general in charge of the whole operation all the way up through Sicily and Italy. And uh, he made us pay for every inch of ground we took because uh, Italy is full of hills and mountains. And every time we take one, he'd be fortifying the next one up the line. And they always had a new line of defense. Uh, I, I can't remember all of them, but there was the Volturno line, which was the divided Volturno River, there was Gusto line, there was the Hitler line. Uh, it was always another line of defense, and uh, he'd make us pay. He even tried to get to Monte Cassino. Highway 6 in Rome took us right between two mountains, Mount Lungo on one side of the road, and Rotundo on the other side, I think it was, now, Germans are holding both sides, and the gap in between them was called Mignano Gap, which meant we had to go through Mignano Gap to get up to where Monte Cassino was, and they held high ground on both sides of us. And it, uh, again, they, they, the 88 millimeter weapon that the Germans had was a fantastic weapon, and they used it for everything. They used it for artillery. They used it for any aircraft. It was quite a weapon. It was a very effective weapon. Yeah. Now, did, did you see any combat? <laughs> if you're talking about nose-to-nose -nose with some Germans, no. But in, in a combat area, I spent 528 days in combat. Uh, I Most of the time under direct artillery fire, or bombings, you name it. Uh, we had occasion to capture some Germans, uh, but uh, not that way. Uh, a lot of our, uh, when we got to Tunisia, for example, the Germans had already mined uh, a lot of the area. So our job as engineers was to clean the mines out of the area. Uh, and we lost quite a few fellas taking out the mines. Uh, so, yeah, but we were just about all the time under direct fire from the Germans. And you mentioned some of the casualties. Yeah. And, you know, were, were there, I mean, a lot, I mean, it sounded like there were quite a few I, I don't know the exact figures. I suppose I could find them out fast enough. But the third division I was in had the most killed in action of any U.S. division and had the most wounded in action of, of the any division over there. Uh, we also had the most Medal of Honor winners. Uh, I think it was 37 of them. Uh, and the most time in combat. Actually, the div division had spent 530 days in combat, and I missed the first three days, so I was with them. They had 531, so I had 528. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. Uh, gosh, I had so many of them. One of the things, we... we moved into Nuremberg, Germany on April 20th, 1945, 
and captured the center of town uh, called Adolf Hitler Plaza, Platz. Ironically, that was Hitler's birthday and made a big show of taking down the German flag and running up the American flag in the center of the plaza. Uh, at the time, uh, General Iron Mike O'Daniel was our division commander, and uh, so we had a little ceremony there on that day. When we went down for the ceremony, uh, our battalion commander, a Colonel Petrick, asked General O'Daniel for permission to blow the swastika off the Nuremberg Stadium. It was a huge swastika that had a wreath around it. It was made out of bronze. Um, I guess it was pretty close to 25 feet in circumference. It was huge. So General O'Daniel said to Patrick they could do that after the ceremony. What ceremony? Well, they wanted a ceremony to five of our uh, guys, the his guys were getting the Medal of Honor. And they had a, quite a ceremony inside the Nuremberg Stadium to award the Medal of Honor to the five. And uh, right after the ceremony was over, let me back up just a little bit. When we're getting ready for the ceremony, uh, I went with Colonel Patrick, and instead of going directly to it, we went by division headquarters and picked up Colonel Ralph Smith. Now, Colonel Smith was familiar to all of us because he was our division chaplain. He was a Catholic priest. And so now it's Colonel Smith, Colonel Patrick, and I, we go down to the Nuremberg Stadium. And what I didn't know at the time is Colonel Petrick was getting an award at that ceremony. So Colonel Smith and I were kind of off to the side, but Colonel Petrick told him where to stand. He had a camera, and he told him where to stand to get some good pictures of blowing the, the swastika off. So it was our group that set the charge, ready to blow the swastika. After the ceremony was over and the, and the troops had left the stadium, we blew the, the swastika off. And that charge was quite a charge. I have a picture of that someplace of that going off. Anyway, uh, wouldn't you know with the shrapnel flying through the air, who gets hit but Colonel Smith with the shrapnel? And quite severely injured. And he now he's laying on the pavement there inside the Naval Stadium. And fortunately, there was an, an ambulance uh, nearby. We got the ambulance. He got off to the hospital. I didn't know how badly hurt he was until after the war. I got a letter from Colonel Patrick. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm going to guess it must have been two years. Because I had written to him. I said, whatever happened to Father Smith? And he said he pulled through it. He was quite severely injured, but he did pull through it and he was okay. Uh, that was quite an experience. I was with Colonel Patrick in Strasbourg. We got a funny request. We got a funny request from the French underground to... Uh, go to a well in town and uh, there was some things in the bottom of the well that they wanted back, that they had hidden there because they didn't want the Germans to find it. So we siphoned the water out of the well and the objects that we took out looked like hunks of coal, like anthracite coal about the size of a baked potato. And, and I can remember Colonel Patrick saying, why would they want pieces of coal? And there were 14 of them down there, 14 of these pieces of coal. And so he turned over 13 of them and kept one so we could find out what was going on here. We'll find out there was a place to put a cap in there. 
<laughs> to, to explode it. It was a small bomb, exactly what it was, and it was made up to look like a hunk of coal. What we found out that the underground was doing is when the German trains would go by, they'd throw a piece of this coal up into the coal car. And sooner or later, the firemen would shovel that, uh, that hunk of coal into the firebox and it would blow up. And that's how they were blowing up the German trains. Uh, it was quite a thing. Just before we got there, uh, 20 miles before Strasbourg, part of the old Maginot line was a Fort Mutzig. And it was occupied by German troops. And the, when the infantry got there, they tried to dislodge them, and uh, they were they were they were in there. Much of, much of this fort was below ground, and uh, so they called up division artillery with their one five five howitzers, and they shelled in, in the entrance, uh, and it did uh, the shells bounced off, and it didn't affect the Germans at all. So then we asked for some uh, air support. And they sent over a couple of fighters with uh, so a couple of 500-pound bombs. They dropped it. But because the bombs weren't hitting exactly the same spot, they were, didn't do it effectively. And then one of the, uh, one of the uh, colonels got a bright idea. He was going to try psychological warfare. He, he told, he got a loudspeaker and told the Germans if they didn't come out, we had a secret weapon we were going to use. And they ignored it. They didn't come out. So General O'Daniels told Colonel Patrick, it's your problem now. The Germans bypassed, uh, the, our infantry bypassed and went on toward. And now we're, how are we going to get them out? You'll find a picture of it in there. We got a hold of an old, of a German half track, the captured half track. And we loaded it with 3,000 pounds of TNT and sent it uh, 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 up across the boat of this fort. And ran it up. Unfortunately, it kind of got off because we just put it in here and ran, let it run up to the entrance of the fort. But it kind of tipped over. It didn't get right up against the door. Anyway, we used a mortar shell to, to blow it. And blow it did. When that thing went off, we blew a hole in the side of the fort about six by six feet by ten feet. And, and the next night, the, the Germans gave up. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, I think it was uh, the, the three three German officers. I think there were 73 enlisted men marched out uh, and surrendered. So we finally got them out of there. Uh. <laughs> now, were you ever a prisoner of war? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> were you awarded any medals or citations? <laughs> Let me see now. I, we, uh, uh, yeah, I, I do have a, a good conduct medal. Uh, I have the victory medal. I have, our outfit has the presidential unit citation twice. We were twice awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French governor, once for combat in southern France and again for combat in the Colmar pocket. If you'll notice that on my uniform, that rope that I wear around my left arm is called a fourchere, uh, and because of being awarded the uh, Croix de Guerre by the French government, I'm entitled to wear that. Uh, so I do have that medal out there. Uh, I've forgotten some of the others. Uh, uh, one of the peculiar things about, uh, I was uh, wounded by shrapnel on Anzio. Now, at the time I'm on Anzio, uh, we didn't know it at the time, of course, but Hitler gave orders to Kesselring to make sure that they drove us off the beachhead. And they threw everything at us, believe me. Uh, at the time I'm on Anzio, my brother is on the other side of Italy. Uh, 
uh, he's a, a B-17 pilot. And they were making runs from Italy up over Germany and back. And uh, when, I, when I got wounded, it was in my, actually it was my right foot. And it tore the top of my foot off. I, I think it did more damage to my combat boots than it did to me. But uh, when, I, when I, had to, I went to the aid station and the, the doctor was a Captain Clark Van Orden, who, who was quite a good friend of mine. And when, when you're in combat, you know, sometimes we've been together so long, the rank, I guess, kind of blurred a little bit, you know, because here it was that, and I spent a lot of time with Captain Van Orden, who was our battalion doctor. Uh, he ran the medical group there. Uh, the, uh, so Captain Van Orden just says, you know, you're, you're entitled to a Purple Heart. And I said, and what good is that going to do me? And he said, well, I'll give you five points. Uh, I said, that's a joke. You know, most of us have enough points. They had, they had a system where you had so many points for every month, so many points for every month overseas, so many points for every battle star. Yeah, uh, and after you got so many points, you were supposed to be rotated home. Well, you know, practically our whole division had more points, more points than are necessary. They didn't go to rotate us home, so that was a joke. So I said, do they still send telegrams? He said, yeah. He said, there'll be a telegram sent to your house. I said, then forget it. I, you know, the last thing my mother needs at this point is a telegram coming to our house. I'm on the beachhead, my brother's flying B-17 bombers, uh, forget it. Interesting enough, it was never entered into the company log, so it didn't show up on my service record. But just recently, I wrote to the commanding general of the 3rd Infantry Division, because I know that there's a record of my being wounded in the medical records of the 10th Engineer Battalion of the 3rd Division. And the 3rd Division is stationed now in Fort Stewart. So he passed it out to somebody, and I would you believe I got a letter? Because I said, if they can find it, I just can't believe that they destroyed the medical records of the battalion. They're there someplace. And I told him that. And whoever he turned it to, I, I, I got a letter just a week before last from somebody down there in the records department said they went through my, my uh, army records and there's nothing on my record. I knew that. And I told him there was nothing there because one of the peculiar things that after the after we took Nuremberg, our first sergeant was sent home, and they made me first sergeant. But by that time, they had frozen all the ranks, so I didn't get the stripes to go with it, but I was the company first sergeant from then until I was shipped home in September. And I knew what was in my records because I had access to them. I was the first sergeant. And so I knew it wasn't there. But, I, you know, but just recently, somebody had said to me, why don't you try to get your... Purple Heart. So uh, I, 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 I'm at the point where I said, so what? You know, uh, the only thing I found out that if you if you did have a Purple Heart, you get preferential treatment up in the VA. So, uh, you know, that's why I wrote for, to it. But uh, I don't seem to be getting any place. I'm, so I'm at the point now where uh, do I write back and tell them? <laughs> I know that that's not in my record. But it's in the medical records of the battalion, and I, it, it's there. Because Captain Van Orden was a very good friend of mine, and I corresponded with him after the war. I should have asked him to write an affidavit or something, but I, it didn't register, and he went and died on me. And so did Colonel Patrick. Colonel Patrick died uh, three years ago. The last... Radio operator I trained, Berger, 
lived in St. Louis, and I, we did see him. Uh, uh, he died last last year. No, two thousand eight. He just died, and I didn't know it. It was funny because. Like that, we said Christmas cards to each other. I didn't get a Christmas card from Berger. And I thought, gee, that's odd. So in January, I called the house and Virginia answered his wife, Virginia. And I said, Ginny, this is a, a Joe Moriello calling. And I said, I didn't get a Christmas card. Is something wrong? And she said, oh, Joe, she said, I didn't tell you. Tell me what? I said, he said Virgil died uh, last November. Then I, she, she just, she, so, uh, we still correspond, but uh. <laughs> well, um, how did you stay in touch with your family when you were when you were shipped overseas? Who was the main, um, you know, mode of communication? Strictly letters, yeah, and only letters. And of course, you know, we had the old V-mail back then when it condensed the thing. Uh, yeah, we could write back and forth, and that, and it was free. Uh, you can write as often as you want. And sometimes we didn't have a chance to write. Sometimes we'd be off the line for a while. We had more of a chance to write. But uh, uh, one of the things you're going to find talking about uh, correspondence, when I was in Casablanca, North Africa, I, I got a, a, a letter. Bob forwarded a letter to me from my draft board. <laughs> they were going to draft me. <laughs> I was already in Africa. And so I went to the camp commander and I told him, I have to go home. He said, why? I said, I got to let off my draft board. They want me to report to the draft board so I could get drafted. <laughs> he said, get out of here. <laughs> then he had a good laugh at it, but I didn't get it. <laughs> they wouldn't let me go home and be drafted. Uh, but what, what happened is we had a general, and you'll read about it when you read it, but it's a good story. General Truscott didn't think that the infantry moved over the ground fast enough. So while we were in training in Casablanca, or just outside of Casablanca, near Rabat, uh, we had these marches, very frequent, loaded, full pack, rifle, the whole works. At the time, it was normal for infantry troops to move at about three and a half miles an hour. That wasn't fast enough. He wanted us to do five miles the first hour and four miles every hour now. So we'd walk and trot, walk, trot. They, they called us the Truscott Trot. And it sounded like a dance when it was, you know. But the damn wind had blowing, the sand and blowing, walking over those sandy areas and everything. My watch stopped. I think it was full of sand. So I packed it up and set it home. And my mother took it down to Colony Street. Michael's Jewelry Store was down at Colony Street. And when she went to pick up the watch, the jeweler said to her, uh, whose watch is this, Mrs. Borello? And she said, my son. Well, I don't know how old he thought Bob's son was, but he said, if I were you, Mrs. Borello, I'd make him take his watch off before he plays in the sandbox. So my mother made sure she told me, to take my watch off when I played the sandbox over there. Now. <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> when um, when you're overseas, what was the food like? Most of the time, and I, I mean most of the time, it was sea rations. See, you've heard of them, people have the square meals. We had round meals, can. <laughs> Uh, and at the time, there were three. You got three. You were. You got three cans. Uh, how am I going to word this? One was beef stew. One was hash, and I think the other was pork and beans. And along with it, you got a can that had biscuits. It had a couple of pieces of hard candy. It had a packet that you could make some lemonade out of. It was terrible. Uh, oh, and another thing for instant, like instant coffee in them. And uh, it, 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 you know what soda crackers are? Around soda crack like that, they had some of them. So you're issued three cans, and you got those three different meals, plus three things. There's not a day's ration. 
which one sounds appetizing for breakfast? You, you know, uh, but we, we heated them up the best we can. And uh, very often, if we stopped long enough, the our cooks would put an immersion heater in a, a big 50-gallon uh, uh, GI can and heat the water up to boiling and put a bunch of the cans in there so that we'd have a, a hot meal. So you'd open up the can. I still think I have my P38, uh, a GI can opener. You ever see one of those? No. Oh, I'll go dig it out for you. I, I'll, I'll show you. They call them P38s, which is a kind of a, a joke because the P38 was a German pistol, a 9mm pistol. Uh, but uh, we all carried it. In fact, most of us carried it on our chain with our dog tags. But we had to open up the can, so we had to have a little can opener. Uh, the uh, Once in a while, we did get... Uh, when we were issued sea ration, and that was sea ration around cans, we had K ration. Now, K ration came in a box about, oh, I don't know, six or seven inches long, about that. And again, it had uh, uh, little different things in it, like it was, again, the, the, uh, a little uh, coffee, uh, lemonade, uh, uh, there was also one called D-Ration. We didn't get D-Ration too much. It was, uh, if we had to go on outpost duty, or, which like at Anzio, most of us did, uh, we'd take a D-Ration because we wouldn't be come back to where we could get a, a, a meal. A D-Ration was a, 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 like a concentrated uh, chocolate bar. Only I think it was something like 600 calories or something like that. So it was quite, uh, uh, but it was enough to sustain you. When we could get off the line, although I would say it while we were at Anzio, we were on Anzio for four months. We, we were bogged down. The Germans had it pinned down. But w one of our cooks was kind of an enterprising fellow. What he would do is, uh, if we had overrun a position We'd try to scrape up things like uh, German rifles, German bayonets, German helmets, uh, uh, what we considered a bunch of junk. But he'd put it in the barracks bag and go down to the ships, down in the harbor that were unloading supplies, and he'd swap this this German stuff for a fifty-pound bag of flour or fifty-pound bag of sugar. Uh, you know, off the guys on the ship. And so uh, once in a while they'd, they'd bake cake or bake some bread or... Uh, so sometimes we had a, a, a pretty good meal. Uh, well, we were off the line. We had uh, good meals. We had what they'd call Class A rations. So. I can remember, we, hey, one Christmas we even had turkey dinner, uh, which was surprising. Uh, but, but it was okay, yeah. They got it to us hot. It was all right, yeah. I don't know where it was baked and cooked or whatever, but we, we got it. It came up hot, yeah. It's all that matters, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. Did you feel like you were well supplied over there? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I went in, I was 127 pounds. I came out at 190. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 could, I could honestly say we always had enough ammo. We always had, it, it wasn't the greatest food. At, at sea rations, we all considered lousy rations, but hey, uh, that's what we had. One of the early things that I did, was one of the best things I ever did, is uh, I captured a, a an Italian officer, and three men, four men, with Joe Vi John Viola and I, and we overran them. And he gave up, and I got his pistol. It was a nine millimeter Beretta pistol. 
I, I don't have much use for a Beretta pistol, but one of the fellows over there had a, a Coleman stove, which was about this big around and about this tie, and you put gasoline in it, and you pump it up like a, a blowtorch, and you, you light it. I swapped my Beretta pistol for that Coleman stove. And you know, I carried that pole and stole with me for the rest of the war. It was the best thing I ever did. Uh, because sometimes, like going through Sicily, uh, sometimes we'd go by some farms, and I'd help myself to zucchini, squash, tomatoes, and then I'd put it in my mess kit and put in some sea ration with it, mix it together, and get my little stove going. I had some pretty good meals. Uh, I, I kept that, and well, we did have to get into a pup tent. That little Coleman stove would heat up that pup tent in about five minutes. It was, you know, it would get warm. I, I, I kept that stove for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel any pressure or stress when you were overseas? Uh, always, yeah, yeah. It was always that, 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 yeah. Some guys broke under it. Uh, and it, it I, I've seen guys laying in their foxhole with their leg up in the air, hoping to get hit in the leg so they could be shipped out and sent home. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a fearful time. You know, you you get shelled in the daytime, you get bombed at night, you get, you know, you're shot at, you have 88s coming at you. Yeah. Very stressful time, yes. Uh after a while, you get kind of immune. Uh, as I write in my book, that first time that, that Corporal Redmond got killed in Tunisia, you know, I was, he was only three feet from me. And I had trouble sleeping the next two or three nights because every time I closed my eyes, I saw him get killed all over again. After a while, for some peculiar reason, you kind of get immune to it. And, and one of the things that you don't realize that, that war has a smell to it, and it's a lousy smell. Going through some of those towns in the heat of summer, when their bodies are laying in the street or on the side of the road or whatever, and with that awful heat, they're bloated up to the, you know, and, it, and the smell is a bad, bad, bad smell. Uh, but it, like like so much else, it, it's it's it becomes a way of life. So you get a kind of immune to it. Uh, you know, when the shelling starts, you run for your foxhole and you you just buried your head and, and uh, afraid. You know, when it came over, you're in your foxhole and hope that one doesn't land right on top of you. But uh, you know, everybody prays I think in the foxholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was there anything special that you would do for good luck? No, 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 no. <laughs> How did people entertain themselves over there? <laughs> really not much. Every payday gambling got, got to be the big thing, I think. Crap games and poker games. But there's two things that happened. On the way through, on the way through Algeria, one of the guys, I'm trying to remember the name of the town, Mustaganum, Mustaganum, Algeria, he bought a monkey. And the guy that bought the monkey was the guy that drove our ammo truck. I say ammo. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, rifle bullets and things like that. It was also our, our mines, because uh, we also did a lot of mine leg, especially at uh, places like Anzio and so forth. Uh, so we named the monkey, he did, named the monkey Ammo. Ammo was a source of, of quite a bit of entertainment. Because we, we'd stop in certain areas. Uh, one of the things that gave us a good laugh is, is one night the, the Germans were shelling it, and all of a sudden 
Sergeant Roberts, I'm hit, I'm hit. Get, and so we kind of blocked out and tried to see where he was hit. He wasn't hit at all. What had happened was uh, <laughs> the shelling ammo got so scared, she grabbed him by his leg. And <laughs> he ducked his clue. Ammo was uh, hanging out for dear life, and he thought he'd been hit by shrapnel. Uh, one of the people who visited it with us every once in a while was a noted colleague, uh, Ernie Pyle. I don't know if you ever heard of Ernie Pyle. Great war correspondent. Uh, he wrote several books. Uh, one of the books called Brave Men was written by Ernie Pyle. Uh, and he talks about the 10th Engineer Battalion, our group, in his book Brave Men. But uh, Ernie Pyle was visiting us uh, on Anzio. And... Uh, Ammo liked sliced peaches. And we used to get these uh, number 10 cans, you know, uh, like a gallon sized can of sliced peaches. We seemed to get a lot of sliced peaches. Ammo loved them. And Ernie Pyle went through the line with us and got his food. And he put the top of his mess kit down. And now we had to stay away from each other. We, stay, we spread out like five feet from each other. So if a shell hit, it doesn't take out a whole bunch of people. So he's sitting there, and we could see ammo come up and go up the tree. So we made sure that somebody over there is talking to, so his attention is directed over there, and down comes the monkey over on this side, and eats all of his peaches. So when he finishes, so the rest of us are making believe we don't see a thing. And when he goes to pick up the tray, there's nothing in it. And he's looking all around like this. And, of course, Ammo's up there. And uh, so he, he didn't say anything. He got up and he went back into the line again and got some more peaches. And he put it down beside him. And he started looking around. And poor, poor, here comes Ammo right down the tree again. The early pile quickly and saw the monkey eating his peaches. Uh, but we got a good laugh out of so him. He, 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 the, uh, all the way along, we got kind of kick out of uh, Ammo was the source of entertainment for us because he's always doing something wacky. Peculiarly enough, he knew the sound of that ammo truck. He could be sound asleep someplace, and if he heard that truck start up, he, boom, he'd run. Now, on Anzio, our, our CP-10 command post, had a tree right beside it, and a branch came out over the the roadway. It was it wasn't a roadway; it was two ruts. In the, the, and uh, when he started going out, and he used to drive down to the beach to pick up his supplies and come back. And as soon as Ambo would hear that truck, he'd run up the tree and out on that branch. When a truck came by, he'd drop himself down, and he'd ride along with that guy down to the beach and come back. And he, well, one day uh, he heard the truck start up. The guy came through. Ammo ran up the, up the tree, ran out on the branch and made a dive. He had already gone by. He missed. And he fell under the back wheels of the truck and, and Ammo got killed on Anzio. And it, it was a sad time because we hated to see him go. He was a source of entertainment for us for quite a while. But poor Ammo got killed on that hill. And not by fire, he got run over by the old Ammo truck. Wow. <laughs> you said um, Ernie Pyle, right? Yes. He was an entertainer? or No, enter he was a war correspondent. Oh, okay. Ernie Pyle, after he left the European theater, he went to the Pacific theater. And if I remember the story right, Ernie Pyle was a very, very popular man. If you go back any any of the history of back World War II, you can find Ernie Pyle's name crop up. But he was in a jeep, as I understand it, and a, somebody took a shot at him, and they got out of the jeep behind the stone wall, and, uh, and they were behind the stone wall for quite a while. And Ernie says, I think he's probably gone by now. And the driver tried to tell him, no, 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 no. We wait till after dark, and he said, well, I'm going to take a peek. He peeked over the wall, and the sniper got it right, Pongo, right there. 
and killed him uh, at, at Okinawa in the Pacific. A nice guy, nice guy. Yeah, we we ran into him quite often. <laughs> Did um, were there ever any entertainers that came to? Uh, once, to once I saw them. Yes, we, we uh, our division took Palermo. Palermo is the capital of Sicily. We landed at Licata, down the south of Sicily, went straight up and cut Sicily in half, right up to uh, the northern coast, to, took the city of Palermo. What happened is General Patton was Corps commander, and apparently he drew kind of an imaginary line, I think they call it a blue line for some reason, about several miles south of Palermo and sent word down through from Corps to Division not to go beyond that line because he wanted to make a grand entrance into Palermo with his tanks. He did, and he made his grand entrance into Palermo, and when he got there, one of the bat battalion of our division infantry was already in town, had taken the town, and was sitting there drinking, <laughs> and Patton got really upset that, but what happened, I guess, by the time the word got from Corps, down to division, to the regiments, to battalion, down to the company, they were already in town, so, you know. But he pulled us off the line. We were off the line for over a week, just about a week, I guess, and sent back to the west coast to a town called Trapani. And while we were at Trapani, Bob Hope and his crew showed up. And we did see one, a Bob Hope show, and that was the only time I saw that. He had a Bob Hope, a Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna were the entertainers. Yeah, and so they put on a show for us. Uh, and I think the band, if I'm not mistaken, was oh, 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 Les Brown. Yeah, it was quite a show. Yeah. Did you get any leave when you were in the service? <laughs> as many times as I went looking for a furlough, I never got one. I never had a furlough. I never had so much as a three-day pass. No, never. From the day I enlisted till the day I was discharged, nothing. Zero. <laughs> so I guess you did nothing on leave because you didn't have it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Other than your um, your combat deployments, uh, where did you travel while you were in the service? Oh, that was about all of it. Uh, because, well, well, not quite all of it. Uh, as I said, the, the boat took us from the United States. I went from Camp Fort Devons, Camp Cross, Fort Knox, Camp Campbell, Fort Dix, overseas. And after all that traveling, our outfit also took Bert Bridges Garden, which is at Hitler Hideaway. And, and, uh, and if you watch the movie Band of Brothers, they gave credit to the 101st Airborne. And I got to tell you, that was wrong. The 101st Airborne did not take Bridges Garden. We did. In fact, the, the second one into Bridges Garden was the uh, 1st French Infantry Division. The 101st Airborne came in third. But they gave him credit at Steven Spielberg in that movie. Anyway, that's beside the point. We we were in uh, we were in Austria the, when the war ended, and I was there until September, and they moved me up to the coast. They had a bunch of these little camps uh, uh, along the coast in France. Uh, well, well, was called Lucky, uh, Lucky Strike and, and Philip Morris and things like that. And then every once in a while, we, we get our names to be called off, and we would shift across the, the English Channel into England in a town of Southampton, where we were waiting to load the boat. And peculiarly enough, our group was supposed to come home on the Queen Mary. And it, 
And while we were waiting there for the queen to come back from one of the other runs, we got a, a notification that we were being taken off to make room for a group of wax that were on their way home, which was not thrill us very much. Anyway, they said, but we don't have to wait for the queen. They got a boat leaving the next day, so we loaded the boat. I'm not sure. I think it was a Liberty ship. It went up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, but we sailed before the, the Queen Mary got back. And the funny part of it is we're out about eight, eight or nine days out into the Atlantic. And here came the Queen Mary, went right there, went by us. I think they made the trip in four days. I think it took us 14 to get from England to New Jersey. Yeah. But I got home in October. When I say home, I got back on, on United States soil in late October and ended up again at Fort, Fort Dix, I think I was. Yeah, Fort Dix. And, and uh, then was put on a put on a, a troop train from there, shipped up back up to Fort Devons, and then a process for discharge. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I was discharged November 1st, 1945. November 1st, 1945. Uh, so I, I, you know, outside of that little bit of going into England, and, yeah, uh, that's about it. You've told me a, a couple funny stories already. <laughs> But um, can you think of any more, you know, humorous or unusual events that uh, that you remember? I'm not trying to think of too many numerous events. Yeah, I, I when we arrived in Strasbourg, there was a, a, a the Germans had a, a concentration camp on the outskirts of the town. And we liberated the concentration camp. The concentration camp had a number of uh, uh, Italian soldiers. What happened when we went into Italy? Uh, uh, even in Sicily, the Italian under Mussolini and, under, and, the, and the Germans under Hitler were for the Axis power. But the, once we started the war on Italian territory, the Italians gave up. And I think the Germans knew they were, so they they took a lot of them and, and sent them to their own POW and made them work in the, the uh, German factories making munitions and things like that. So the, this particular concentration camp had a lot of G Italian soldiers and it had a, a, a number of uh, Polish women on the other side of camp. Well, when the camp was liberated, they, they, over there, uh, some, somehow, one of the guys ended up with an accordion, and they, they're having like a dance. Now, I mentioned those two operators, the radio operators that I trained. One was John Viola from Brooklyn, New York. The other was Virgil Berger out of St. Louis. And John Viola spoke fluent Italian. So once the camp, he went over to camp, he could converse with these guys at the camp. And they're having a dance. I, I couldn't go because it was my turn on the radio. We, we, you know, we took a couple hours and we took time off and we switched, the three of us. So when he got back he said, to, to take over and I was free, he said, why don't you go over to dance? I said, I, I can't be Polish. I'm going to ask somebody to dance. He says, you don't have to. He said, just go walk over, put your arm around one of the girls and, and take her out to, uh, to, to the dance floor. I said, oh, okay. I did. So I go over there, and then there's a girl standing there by the pot-bellied stove. So I, I, I followed, I go over and I put my arm around her shoulder. And next thing you know, my arm was back her up behind my back, 
and she's got me by the back of the neck and a seat in the patch, and she threw me out the door. I mean, she literally threw me out the door. And I landed there in a buck out there. So I went back to camp, and I, I, got, I got on Viola's case. I had huge, and I called him a name. I said, you did that to me. And he swore up and down he didn't. But to this day, I still think he set me up. Uh, he swore up and down he did. He, but he, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. I think he set me up. <laughs> That's a <fun. laughs> Um... What were some of the pranks that you and others would pull on one another, other than <laughs> sit you up with Polish girls and the dance? <laughs> Not too much of that. We were a very close outfit. What? It, 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 I, I don't know. There's something about being with these guys day after day in, in, a, in a stressful combat situation. It's almost like you get protective of each other. You, you know, a, 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 a different kind of a bond. Uh, I don't ever remember really, yes I do, Evans, Feaster and I and Evans. Now, Elmer Feaster was one of my sergeants, Evans was a corporal, you know I can't remember where we were. We, 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 we must have been on the line. Anyway, he got a hold of a couple of bottles of cognac. And so the three of us are in the tent because somebody else was on the radio. And Feaster and I made believe we were taking a drink. We didn't. We, we, we tipped a bottle, but we didn't drink any. But Evans didn't know we were doing that. And he'd take a swallow. Well, pretty soon Evans is loaded, and now he's getting silly, and, and of course at our expense. And f finally, he says, "I think I'll go back to my bunk." And he started to, sp to stand up, and he fell over. He couldn't walk, so Feast and I had to carry him, put him, put him to bed. Uh, that's the only time I ever, ever, ever pulled something on somebody, and we got. Poor Evans drunk. But, uh, we, we didn't really do that to us. What if, <laughs> we, we, strange things happen. I mentioned Feaster. We were in Sicily, halfway between Palermo and Messina. And uh, we were just about settled down for the night. And uh, Feaster had to go to the toilet. And he's squatting over a slit trench with his pants down. And the Germans started shelling it. And I got to tell you, it was a sight watching Feaster try to run for his foxhole with his pants down around his knees. And he's trying to hold the pants and trying to run. And uh, the guy that was on on uh, guard duty that night was Willie Meeks, who stuttered, and with the shelling, Willie gets all excited, and he's trying to holler, he sees this thing going by, it was Feaster, and he's trying to holler, halt, and he can't get it out, and he's going, ho, 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 ho. And, and I'm hollering at Willie, I said, hit the fox hole, Willie, never mind your halt stuff, and, fe you know, it, it, you know it, it turns out to be a, a, a comedic kind of a situation, but it, it wasn't all that funny at the time. We were being shelled, you know. It's, uh, uh, every once in a while we have kind of incidents like that, but we do we weren't much for doing pranks on each other, though. What did you think of your, um, your fellow officers and your fellow soldiers? Uh, the, 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 uh, I would say that we would have followed Colonel Patrick anywhere. He was a soldier's soldier. One thing that he did, we, we got a new, we got a brand new captain in from North Africa when we were in southern France. I, I don't know what happened to our, our captain we had got transferred. We got a new one in. And I guess he didn't know how things were done in our, our outfit. 
So when it came to the chow line, the captain goes up to the chow line and goes up to the head of the line, which apparently in his outfit, the officers got treated that way. They got to the front of the line. Colonel Petrick saw him go up front of the line and he, he turned to Major Hayden and says, go get him. And so the Major ran down and told the captain, come back, the Colonel wants to see you. And, and so the Colonel said to him, Captain, in this outfit, officers don't eat until all the enlisted men have eaten. He said, you can get on the back end of the line, but you don't get in the front of the line. So he never pulled out again. But that was Patrick. Uh, I think we'd have followed him anywhere. He was really, really a, a, a great officer. Uh, our company commander was kind of a jerk, I thought. Uh, Sergeant Summers and I got in a little bit of trouble in France. We, we had pulled into an area in woods, and when we looked up, the mountainside beside it is this castle on the top of the hill. And the company commander, who we kind of thought was kind of a jerk, he got us all together and he said, nobody is to leave the area. We may pull out at a minute's notice. Okay. So Sergeant Summers and I went up through the woods up to the castle. Knock on the back door. <laughs> guy answers the door. I speak, I write, I read French. So I politely asked him, I said, could, could we, would you show us around your castle? He said, I'd be delighted. Oh, we're talking French, okay? So he invites us in. So Sergeant Summers and I go inside the castle, and he takes us to the living room, and who's sitting in the living room? The captain, and another captain, <laughs> and another captain. <laughs> See, the officers are up there. They're telling us we're not leaving the area. They're sitting up there, the captain. <laughs> now, now what do you do? You know, we we're told not to leave the area. Now we're caught. Uh, the the French said, uh, are these officers from your outfit? And I said, yeah. And I said, and they told us a little while ago we were not to come up here. And now we're caught. <laughs> and he said, oh, I got you into trouble. I said, hey, I think we got away with it a little bit uh, because they heard me speaking French. So uh, that came in a little bit handy while we we're in France. So uh, we kind of got off the hook a little bit. But uh, that was a no-no. Uh, uh, we thought, sure, we were going to get busted. Uh the only time I did get in trouble was for stealing chickens. Uh, I didn't think that was too bad. <laughs> I didn't think I stole them. I thought it was liberating them, but really, uh, you know, and, and that was in, in uh, that was in Italy, and we, and we got uh, I got two chickens, and we stripped them and cleaned them, and uh, the the crank for the three-quarter ton truck is about this long. So it, it, it's great to put two chickens on and it's got the, you know, and we cut the sticks there and, and we're, we're sitting there, my buddy and I, he was from Hartford. Chappy, Chappy, Leon Chapman. And uh, so we're sitting there with our two chickens and here comes uh, the first sergeant with his Italian guy and, and, and we were cooking his chickens, <laughs> and we had to, he, he wanted 200 lira for his two chickens, so we had to cough up 200 lira, which meant $2, 100 lira, which was cheap enough. Hey, we had chicken dinner. We didn't have to eat sea rice, you know. Cheap enough. But uh, <laughs> Once when we were, I, I mentioned my cousin John Carroll. John ended up as a first lieutenant in the 503rd MP Battalion of the 3rd Army. Now, the 3rd Army was under Patton going across. They were in Luxembourg, 
and we were just south of them, and we were off the line for 10 days in a little town called pont a mousson which is near Nancy, France. And I was down in town one day, and I got uh, talking to one of the sergeants from our own division, MP company. And he said, uh, we picked up a couple of guys. Now, the 3rd Division then is in 7th Army area. 3rd Army is here, 1st Army is up there. And uh, so he said, uh, we've got to take a ride up to 3rd Army headquarters uh, tomorrow to deliver a couple of prisoners. And I said, oh, can I ride up with you? And he said, sure, it's all right with us. <laughs> so I went back and I got a hold of Sergeant Davis, our first sergeant. And I said to Davis, I said, cover for me for a couple of days, will you? He said, why? I said, I want to run up to uh, Third Army Headquarters, I said, uh, uh, to visit my cousin. Oh, he says, you, you can't do that. I said, why not? He says, the MPs will pick you up. You can't go from Third Army, Seventh Army area to Third Army. They'll know right away. No, no, I, I said, uh, hey, I, I, I'd like to go see him. I said, you, you just cover for me. So the next morning I went down, I met the sergeant, and uh, they had a three-quarter ton truck. We piled in. Off we go. We drove up to Luxembourg. And I, I go into Third Army headquarters, and the MP, and I asked for my cousin, John. I said, oh, geez, you just missed him. He left yesterday to go someplace he had to go for, for he'd be gone a couple of days. You were going to wait? I said, well, I, I really can't wait. You know, I don't know when we're going to be put back on the line because uh, I didn't know how long we were going to be off the line. And so uh, I said, I better not. So I got a hold of the sergeant. I said, when are you going back? He said, tomorrow morning. So I say that evening, they, they put me up. I ate supper there, breakfast. We load the truck and I come back. So when I saw Sergeant Davis, I said, I'm back. He said, oh, good. The next day, my cousin John, and I had left word with, with them up there where I was and where I was stationed. My cousin John shows up. Well, uh, that this is something else. They got MP on the front of their helmets, you know. The airman, MP. Across the front of the Jeep is this big sign of the military police, you know. So John and his driver pull into the yard where we're in town. And the first person he runs into is Sergeant Davis, my first sergeant. And he said, uh, Davis goes up to Jeep and he salutes and he said, can I help you, sir? He said, yeah, I'm looking for Sergeant Borello. Davis says, Morello, Morello, you sure you got the right outfit? Davis thinks I got in trouble, and the police are looking for me for going into Third Army area. I didn't tell him you know, what, what I had done at all. So now he figured, Morello, he said, he said to nobody in our outfit by that name. He said, I'm, yeah, are you sure you got it? He said, I ought to know. I'm the first sergeant. I know everybody in the outfit. And he said, well, yeah, he said to us, the 10th Engineer Battalion Headquarters. He said, no, he says, I, I'm sorry. Well, by this time, I have to look out the window. And I and I see John out there, and I holler out the window. I said, don't move. Stay there. And I run down and out, out to the thing. But, of course, by this time, Davis is red in the face because, but John knew what, it, what was happening. Yeah. He said, he says, I understand, Sergeant. So he let Davis off the hook. I had to explain to Sergeant Davis later that I rode with the MPs. That's right. But uh, so we had a nice visit. John stayed two days with us there at Pont de Uh We had no room for him there, so I talked to a French family down the street, uh, and they put him up uh, for uh, for the night. He got a nice uh, bedroom to himself and uh, all the comforts at home. Uh, he said it was the best bet he had ever since he was overseas. So I ran into John twice over there, once in, in uh, Montebusso, France, and again uh, in Munich. I ran into a roadblock with, with the Jeep. It was at night. I didn't see the damn thing, and I rode into it. 
demolished the Jeep. Thank God it was a Jeep that we had captured from the Germans. Uh, so it was, we didn't have any record of it. Uh, but I demolished the Jeep and I'd end up in the hospital. What happened? I went, but when, when I hit the roadblock, I went through me forward and the windshield wipers right up here on the top of the Jeep would, and it cut my forehead and blood poured down my face. So when I get to the hospital, it, you know, I'm with blood, but that's all it is, some scratches on my forehead. So John's outfit was at Munich then, so I called him up from the hospital. I said, John, come and get me out of the hospital and take me back. So he did. <laughs> Well, did you um? Did you keep a personal diary? Or no, I wish I had. I really do, uh, but I didn't know. But when I wrote my my as much as I can remember, I did have to go back and do a little research, especially for dates, yeah. because they're a little bit elusive. Uh, some dates stand out, like that February 29th, because it was that odd day in February, you know, in '44 when they bombed the hospital. Uh, but they, you know, I wish I had, I really did. Well, how did you end your military career? Well, again, for World War II, uh, once I got home uh, and discharged from the service, uh, I came home, now it's November, and, and really a peculiar thing happened. Uh, my uncle was living with us at the time, and he had, he said, uh, there was a store downtown in Barron for sale. And he said, uh, I'm thinking about buying it. He said, I think we can make some money. He said, uh, I'd like you, you know, to go in business with me. And I said, no, that's nice, Uncle Jack. But I, I said, I really want to go back to school. Now, you got to understand that I, I was, grew up during a depression. My father lost a job. My mother had a part-time job once in a while. And, you know, there was no chance in hell that I was going to go to college. Uh, there was no money at all in the family. Uh, in fact, we were in danger of losing the house. So for a few years, uh, we lived with Uncle Jack, who, who at that time had lost his wife, uh, because he had a very large appointment and rented the house so we wouldn't lose the house and use the rent money to pay the mortgage kind of thing until it kind of blew over. But anyway, now, here it is. that We, we moved back into our house, and Uncle Jack moved over in with us. And he wants to buy this business and wants me to go in business. I want to go to school. So he said, okay, he said, uh, uh, that I'm going to ask your brother Vic. Now, Vic was working up in Boston at the time at the Boston Navy Yard, so he called my brother Vic, who was the B-17 pilot I mentioned earlier. And Vic said, yeah, he said, I, I'll go down. I, I, so he came down and went into business with Uncle Jack. I went over to Wesleyan in Middletown and uh, see, see about going to school under the GI Bill. And the fellow said, okay, I have to take an entrance exam. I said, okay. Uh, I had taken a college course in the school, high school, so uh, I took the entrance exam, and it was middle January, maybe. I got a letter from Wesley, and it said, congratulations, uh, you are hereby accepted into our freshman class in September. Well, it's January, you know. Now I'm thinking, you know, I really don't want to go looking for a job. If I get a job I like... I may never get to school. And I didn't want to wait. And, and mom said, why don't you take a ride up to New Britain? And he said, usually the first two years are pretty much the same. And if you want to later, you can transfer. I said, okay. So I drove up to New Britain. Uh, and I, I went in to see the, uh, what, the dean there, who was in charge of Veterans Affairs. And he said, school started yesterday. He said, can you come tomorrow morning ready to bring a pen and a notebook? And he said, what I'll do to today, I'll set up your classes for tomorrow. Stop here like 7.30 tomorrow morning. I'll have everything ready for you. Your classes are going to start at 8 o'clock. And I said, okay. 
So I did. I said, and just like that, now I'm up, up. Well, at the end of two years, I liked it. So I stayed. Uh, and I enjoy teaching. Yeah. So that's how come I ended up at Teachers College. Uh, kind of a fluke because I was going to be a freshman, but I had to wait, whatever it is, nine months. I didn't want to wait. So I, I, even though I started in 46, actually, I graduated in 49. So it looks like I, I spent three years in college, but it was a little more than that. Yeah. And your education was supported by the GI Bill? Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, um, it sounded like you made a lot of close relationships when you were in the service. Yes, and yes, did yes. You, uh, did you continue any of those relationships? I mean, you yeah. <laughs> that you did with some. So. Yes, yeah. Uh, now, I, we graduate, I graduated from Teachers College, I think it was the 16th of, of June in 1949, and on the 25th of June, we got married. And my wife was a, a secretary at International Silver here in town, and so she took two weeks vacation. So she took the week before she, we got married, because she was having some showers. Some of her girlfriends were giving her a shower, you know, wedding shower. And then we, so we had a, a week of her vacation. I had a contract with the city of Marin to teach, but it was for September. Mm -hmm. You know, now here it is June. So we get married and we got a week. So we decided we'd go up to uh, uh, Niagara Falls and go into Canada maybe cut across Canada, cut back into the United States, visit Chicago, and then come back home. So we did. We went up to the, crossed over the border to Canada, drove across, got to Chicago. Now, in Chicago, the Sergeant Daly, who I got, was very close with in the service, and we visited with him. And he said, uh, he was in contact with Berger, you heard me mention him, Virgil Berger. He was in St. Louis. Well, the next thing you know, we drove south to St. Louis. And uh, for some reason, I couldn't get the car turned around. It kept going west and west and west. And uh, I called ahead to Las Reno, Nevada. Uh, Sergeant Summers, the one I got in trouble with going up to the castle. He lived in Reno. As luck would have it, his parents owned a motel. So we stayed at the motel and visited with Sergeant Summers and his wife. And then I called ahead to uh, Evans. Evans is the one we got drunk. Mm -hmm. And we stayed at Evans' house in California. He lived in Napa, California. Two weeks, I helped him paint his house, and, and he, he took us around to different places of interest in California. It was a nice two weeks. We finally left there, drove south through the Kings Canyon, down through Sequoia National Park, into Needles, into the Grand Canyon, spent time with the Grand Canyon. To make a long story short, we got back in Merritt, the day before Labor Day in September. Now, we got married June 25th. We were gone all of July, all of August, and now it's September. And we get back into marriage. Now, my wife at this point doesn't know if she has a job. She's supposed to be gone for two weeks back in June, and now it's September. She walked in. They never said a word to her. She sat down at her desk. <laughs> but... <laughs> You've got to have a sore throat. While we're out in Napa, California, the Evans gave up their bedroom for us, and they moved to another bedroom. And right next to us was their, their two kids. Uh, the youngest one, David, came down with the mumps. And during the middle of the night, he was fussing, so uh, he wanted a drink of water. So my wife got up, uh, gave him a drink of water, and tried to get him back to sleep again. Wouldn't you know, she caught the mumps from him. And it didn't show up until we got home. So she goes back to work one day 
And she goes to the nurse, and the nurse says, you've got mumps, go home. So she went home for another two weeks on the mumps. <laughs> but uh, uh, I started teaching. Would you believe my first year salary as a teacher? Now, I'm not talking about a month or a week. I'm talking about a year salary, $2,400. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> Imagine that, $2,400. That was a year's salary. We got it twice a month for 10 months. Yeah. Well, what a lot further than it does now, huh? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. So you went on to be a teacher? Yes. After, yes. After the I was very fortunate, though. I, I only taught for five years. And then uh, I, I got my first principalship. And uh, for the next 35 years, I was principal. Uh, I ended up being principal of uh, seven, seven different schools in Meriden. And started out with the smallest one, which only a 10-room school, Eli Whitney, up on Broad Street. And then uh, I from, moved from there to a 15-room school down here on Sherman Avenue, Trumbull School, which is now uh, has apartments in it. Uh, it's right next to the firehouse down here. Uh, and then I, I, I was moved to Ben Franklin School over uh, West Main Street, which was a 17-room schoolhouse with a cafeteria and a gymnasium, which we didn't have a trouble or Whitney. And then it was funny, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and I pick it up, and it was uh, Dr. McGrath, our superintendent, and he says, Congratulations. I said, for what, George? He said, you've just been named the new principal of Hooker. They were building Hooker School over on uh, Overlook, over off Paddock Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you, you're, you're going to be the new principal for the brand new Hooker School. I said, George, I didn't even apply for it. He says, yeah, I know that, but you're going to go anyway. So uh, I ended up uh, opening Hooker. Well, while I was at Hooker, I was only there two years, uh, John Conroy got sick at, at uh uh, junior high school. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. At junior high school. And so every once in a while I was called out to go and put, put out the fire down at the junior high school. Uh, back in those days, they had no assistant principal, and it was, so it was just the principal. Uh, as it turned out, Conroy didn't come back to school, and he, he wanted to move me into the junior high school. Back in those days, when you got your master's, you had to have a master's degree to be principal. And they separated elementary administration from secondary administration. Elementary administration covered kindergarten through grade eight. Secondary covered seven through 12. Mm -hmm. Most people had one or the other. You either had an elementary administration certi certification or you had secondary. Well, the junior high school had seven, eight, and nine, which means if you had secondary, you're fine. But if you had elementary, you're only covered to eight. I guess I was one of the freaks in town. I was the only one in town that had dual certification. I did my master's in elementary. I did my sixth year in secondary administration. So I had both because a peculiar thing happened. My primary emphasis at Teachers College was elementary education. But I had a minor in French and I had a minor in history. So I was certified to teach grade seven through 12 for French and history. Well, when I started teaching, after three years, you apply for tenure and get your, we got what to call like a temporary, then we got our permanent certificates. They don't do that anymore. But whoever copied my permanent just copied the whole thing. So I ended up with a permanent certificate for K through 8 elementary and 7 to 12 on the same certificate for secondary. So I was covered there. So then I, I got my master's in elementary and my sixth year in secondary. So I was covered for both. So I ended up as a junior high school principal. But it was during my tenure, as I mentioned before, that it changed to a middle school. And uh, 
I did not care for for uh, uh, the, the middle school. I stayed with it for five years, but I talked to Dr. McDath. I said, George, first chance you get, you get me back to the elementary school. That's where I belong. He said, okay. And they were building Pulaski School at that time up at Sepa Park. And he said, uh, you want Pulaski School? And I said, yeah. So I, I got Pulaski School in 1972. And I stayed there until I retired at 89. Yeah. All right, so um, how has your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? I, I think right now, uh, I enjoyed my, my stay. Uh, I, I, in fact, when I was recalled for Korea, that was 50 to 52. So it interrupted my teaching a little bit. But by that time, don't forget, I had over three years during World War II, and now I got two more years of Korean War. I've got five years in. I've got one year teaching in. You know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, this isn't a bad life. I, I, I enjoyed the military life. I, I will admit, in the second in the Korean War, I had a, a pretty cushy job. I was commandant of the leaders' school. They found out that I had certified as a, a teacher, and so they, they gave me that job. So I ran the, the leaders' school. The leaders' school was intended for leadership courses for the top three grade non-coms. So I had staff sergeants, tech sergeants, and master sergeants in my classes. So I ran the school. I had two other officers that were under me. I was a guy to write up the lesson plans, of, you know, and the different things that we were to cover in school. So I, I really had a, 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 a good job. Well, we finally got overseas, and uh, uh, I was made a communications officer for the 3rd Battalion, which puts me up battalion headquarters. So again, I had a, a fairly comfortable job. It was a job that I was trained for in communications. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I enjoyed the military. If I wasn't, I was married at the time. And that made all the difference, I think. Uh, uh, she was, uh, my wife was not fond of just pick it up and move it, pick it up and move it. So uh, uh, that part didn't throw me either. So we decided I'd go back to teaching. Uh, so I did, and I'm not sorry I, I did. Uh, my views on some of the war now is more political. I don't, I, it's just my feeling we never should have got our nose in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I think that was, uh, uh, it never should have happened. There's people have been fighting each other, the Sunnis, and they, they've been fighting each other for a thousand years and, and a thousand years after we've left there, they'll be still fighting each other. You know, we had no business being in there, but we're there. And, and so far, it's cost us, what, over 4,000 guys? Yeah, you know, I, I, I take a very dim view of it, I'll tell you. Are you a member of any uh, veterans' organizations? Yes. Uh, right now, I'm very involved with a group of, of veterans, most of them World War II veterans. We formed an, an organization we call Antique Veterans, because most of us by now are antiques. When 9-11 happened, they, they moved the guard out of Merritt. There's no, the only armory on East Main Street is no longer occupied. They're gone. That's an empty building. And uh, it used to hold Company L of the 102nd Regiment. And it was over to do military funerals. So we decided to start doing military funerals. So we do have a uniform. Uh, we have khaki uniform. We wear our ribbons. We're entitled to that. We wear our, our patch of, of the service unit we were with on our left shoulder. And we got an antique veteran patch for the right shoulder. We have 
the flags for every branch of the service, including Merchant Marine and, and Armed Guard and, you know, Coast Guard, the whole works. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, everything. Uh, we have, uh, we owned five Garand M1 rifles for our firing squad. We have uh, three buglers that take turns. And we have uh, the guys that do the flag folding with the casket. Uh, just to let you know how things are going, so far this year, uh, we've done 55 funerals. And since 9-11, as of today, because today is Thursday, we had a meeting this morning, and they keep track of it. As of today, we've done 888 funerals, military funerals. So we, we do the whole schmear. We do everything from stop to finish. Uh, and we not only do the flag, flag, but we have a flag uh, light up for the different flags. And whatever the guy that we're, we're doing the funeral for, whichever branch of service he's in, we tailor what we do to them. If it's a, a Navy guy, we have the bell ringing. An army guy, we have the bayonet, the rifle, and the helmet on it, you know. Uh, uh, and and our buglers know all the service songs. So when we march off, it's always done to the service song to the guy we're marrying. And uh, so uh, that, that is right now kind of keeps us occupied. So how is your service experiences affected your life? <laughs> I, I, that's, a, that's a tough one to answer, you know, because, you know, I was a kid. You know, one of the things I think people don't understand, wars aren't fought by, by men, they're fought by kids. Most of us, most of us, were 18, 19 year old kids. Uh, uh, oh, Sergeant Feaster, uh, he was a little older. He, he was married. He had a kid. Uh, I, I say a little older. Uh, he was probably he was probably twenty five when we were eighteen and nineteen. You know, uh, but but at the time, you know, <laughs> there were a bunch of kids uh, over there. Most of the guys I held around with were at the table. John Viola was a little bit older. Uh, but the rest of them, you know, were, were like me. I went in, I was 18. I had my, my, my 19th birthday uh, down in Camp Croft. I had my 20th birthday in Italy. My 21st birthday was in... Uh, And where? France? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, the second one was just a, a little interruption. Uh, I, I think if I had ended up teaching, I probably would have stayed with the with the military. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's I still it's not a great deal for somebody that's married. And especially if you're trying to bring up a family, uh, uh, it's it's not a, a good deal. And I, I think of, you know, I, I was watching it on uh, television last week. They showed a picture of, of one of the ships returning. They've been gone for six months, you know, and their wives and their babies. Are, you know, and what kind of life is this? You know, some of these guys hadn't even seen the kid. And, and he was born while they were gone, and you know, uh, the father's not there helping to bring him up. The, the, what did their wives do for six months while their husbands, you know? I, I, I well, hey, I, I, I don't approve. Was there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? <laughs> you want to spend a week here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I, I, 
as I say, I, 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 a lot of experiences, a lot of heartache, a lot of tears. Scared? Yeah, I was scared. I scared a lot of times. Uh, and I think anybody that says they weren't scared combat is, is you know. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I, I, I went through it, I think. It, but I, I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> uh, yes. I'm very fortunate to be here. I, I, I very fortunate. We were in the town. I, I, have you ever heard of Audie Murphy? That's a, see, I guess we're too far away from World War II. Audie Murphy was the most decorated soldier of World War II. He had every decoration there is. He wrote a, a book after he got out called To Hell and Back. And it became a movie about Audie Murphy. Good, good movie. And Audie Murphy was in our division. In the Colmar pocket, the, the Germans were counterattacked. They had a two-prong attack. One was up here in the Ardennes and one was through Alsace. Well, the one up here became known as the Battle of the Bulge. The one down here was the Colmar pocket. That's where we were. Snow up to here. Um, but what happened was they were pulling back and Audie Murphy climbed up on a burning tank, got to the 50 caliber machine gun, and it was mowing down the Germans. Then, to make a long story short, he broke up the whole attack single-handedly, uh, and it would call for artillery support. And I guess they didn't want to fire because where he was calling was where he was. And, uh, but he got the Congressional Medal of Honor for that, too. Uh, most decorated soldier of World War II, Audie Murphy, 3rd Division. The second most decorated soldier was the Captain Maurice Britt, nicknamed Footsie, Footsie Britt, and he was the second most decorated soldier of World War II. Uh, they were both in our division. Do you, you remember a guy named James Arness? A television show, Gunsmoke? I've heard of the show, but no. Oh, okay. James Arnett, who was Matt Dillon, the sheriff in Gunsmoke, was in the 3rd Division. He was wounded on Anzio and sent home. <laughs> uh, so we had some very important people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You bet. <laughs>